Bloxup. My name is Penilla Bau. I'm Science Director here at Bloxup and have the honor of welcoming you to today's Science Talk. Also, a huge welcome to those of you who are with us physically. It's very nice to see you all. This year, we have a theme of all of our Science Talks called Regenerate. Those of you who've been with me before know that I can read out what do we mean about the regenerative paradigm, quoting one of our industrial researchers from Circular Build Environment Network, uh, Network sorry, Lotte Nystrup, who says part of the regenerative paradigm is giving back, adding value. As we are facing a green transition, we have a lot of policy recommendations within Europe and also outside Europe addressing green transition and sustainable development. Part of Science Talks is also ensuring that we will dive into what does it actually mean. So we go more not just from wording to actual practices, from the storming and uh, setting the agenda to the norming, what, is it, what does it actually entail, and performing. And with me today, I have two formidable guys, namely Mikkel Thomason, postdoc at Royal Danish Academy, Pelle Munk Pedersen, ass assistant professor at Royal Danish Academy. Both of, have been attending and participating in a research project addressing what actually takes place in companies that want to provide sustainable solution. What does it actually entail to be part of that innovation, innovative journey of the green transition? So we go not just from talking, but actually knowing the how-tos. So that is why I have been looking so much forward to today, so that we can start sharing what actually takes place when companies want to embark on the green transition and provide solutions in the how-to. Mikkel and Pille will take us through the journey of today's science talks, and hopefully you will find this as interesting and stimulating as I will. You're more than welcome to ask questions. I have a wonderful colleague sitting ready, uh, dealing with the chat for those of you participating virtually. And I will also return and be able to hold the microphone when we get questions from the audience. For those who, of you who are with us for the first time, BlockSub is a co-community workspace. It is collaborative. We believe in consilience. We believe in cross-disciplinary collaboration. We believe in network. We believe that it requires more than one, opinion, one knowledge domain to ensure urban, urban sustainable development in the future and also today. We have about 400 organizations, members and reciting at BlockSub. So we are not only a Danish phenomenon, we're also a thriving international community. And we welcome you to continue to partake in the community development of BlockSub by being part of our science talks, our other open events, or even reaching out to these wonderful researchers. So enough from me right now. Without further ado, I'm going to say thank you for being with me. We had actually hoped that this would also be a book launched. So rest assured, what you hear today, you will actually be able not only to see again when we publish the ver our science talks today, but you'll also be able to read much more when the book is launched. So thank you, guys. I will return and enjoy. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I think I could say on behalf of both mm -hmm. of us, I guess. and. Uh, just a very short introduction from me, and then I'll leave the floor to, to Pelle. Um, and uh, it has really been really intriguing to be part of this research project. Some of you people will know me from Smith Innovation, where I've been working for the last many years. And we have been engaged in and are engaged in how do you make change happen in construction. And when we discussed that five or ten years ago, there were so many dif different agendas by which you could make construction different. What has been profoundly interesting, I, I think, and really... Mm -hmm. Yeah, a very good learning and opportunity for me is to, to work together on this postdoc project for the last two years. And in particular, because it has made very clear to me that innovation is no more at all open-ended. It's very targeted towards a very specific objective. Mm -hmm. And that is one of being sustainable in an absolute sense. So the presentation we would like to give today will be twofold. First, Taylor will introduce what do we mean by sustainability? 
and what do we mean by absolute sustainability, and what, what are the more specific strategies by which this planetary boundary yeah, balance can be achieved. So you will establish where we're going and why we need to go there rather fast. Mm -hmm. And then in the second half, I'll dig into what happens then if your company trying to pursue these strategies towards absolute sustainability. What are the problems and how do they after all succeed anyhow? So that will be the target, the purpose, the urgency, and I'll look into the process and, and how things perhaps could be done from a firm perspective. Mm -hmm. So on that note, I'll leave it to you. Peter. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for having us. Uh, and as Mikkel just said, I'll start by introducing, well, every time you look into uh, a project that, that deals with sustainable innovation, of course you need to first define what innovation is, and you have to define what sustainable is, otherwise you'll get nowhere. And what I'll start talking about is, uh, well, our approach to sustainability and how that approach uh, generated the cases that we've looked at in this project. Uh, I'll shortly, shortly introduce the cases and then Miguel will talk about them in a more direct way and then you'll know what cases we're talking about. Uh, we're placing the architecture school in Copenhagen and in, in CNAC, which is an institute that has been dealing with sustainability before it was even a concept. Uh, so, uh, if you are interested in some of the things that we're talking about today, uh, go and look at some of these publications because these guys have been looking at stuff like this and what we're talking about today and trying to operationalize it into architecture for decades. Our project is posi positioned here as well. Well, and what we're going to talk about today is, and that I hope is going to be the title when we release our book soon, um, Innovation of Nothing. It's an idea that Mikkel came up with that kind of coins all the ideas that I'm going to try and elaborate, uh, elaborate on now. And it basically tries to target the, 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 um, the paradox that it's, it seems to be for us humans much easier to add than to uh, subtract. Uh, if you look at how, what the science is pointing at, it seems that every time we have a problem we, we add until we solve it. It's even if the situation is that it's just much more efficient to take away. So there's something there, but how do you how do you strategize nothing? And that is what we're going to talk about. This is, uh, in essence, well, um, uh, a book that came out like 10 years ago or something like that. And the project is standing on the shoulders of this, even though it's moving into a, a different, uh, um, quite a different direction. But uh, but um, as such, uh, there will be a book soon, and uh, we'll we'll yell out when it happens. As um, as Mikkel said, well, innovation of what, and uh, and that is the fundamental question. Every time we deal with sustainability, and everywhere we look, when we deal with sustainability, it seems that it is uh, a matter of approach and and also uh, uh, up to discussion uh, what works and what does not work. But maybe what's not up to discussion is that we have to justify, the, or at least qu qualify. Uh, um, innovation in uh, in a in a different way than we've done maybe up through industrialization as well where where novel usually was good um, so as you said well we're looking into something else and sustainability needs to be a purpose driven innovation that 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 aims as this uh, at, at sustainability and again I'm back what what is sustainability then and even worse, what is, uh, and when we are talking about sustainability, basically this project I think looks at sustainability from two angles primarily. There is an economic sustainability uh, aspect. We are only looking at companies and products that are actually viable in the scene today. But the emphasis is on what is environmentally sustainable. And that is what I'm going to talk about now. Because this is, it seems to be the problem. Um, when we're looking at our solutions, we have to figure out what kind of industrial world we're looking into. Um, and the next slide that I'm going to present is basically going to point towards three strategies or ways to look at at, uh, at how to, we can deal with, with sustainability where it at least becomes uh, uh, quite sure that we are working towards an, a, a more sustainable, environmentally sustainable world. But this is the reality that we are looking into and where is where's nature and resources in this discussion. Every, it, seems, it seems clear and every time we're talking about absolute sustainability, it becomes very, very complex, and, and we have to look at the full lifetime of, of the situation, but also look at of, uh, the impacts of what we're doing, not just here, but uh, in all aspects. So you, just to talk about CO2 and stuff like this, it does not seem to be adequate. And basically what we need to do, and seems to be quite clear, is that we have to figure out ways to, to change uh, 
to change what we're doing in a in a meaningful way. And last year, we, we in 22, we found out that basically even with Corona and all that uh, and all the changes that we felt we've done, we've moved nowhere. We are at the exact I was overshoot day when we've used our resources in our part of the world was exactly the same as where it was before. So what we've done so far is not sufficient. And basically, I think we're leaning into two worlds now, and I think the strategies that we are pointing towards are the, not these strategies. And in these strategies, I mean that I think the world is dividing right now into either, you could say, the logical um, progression uh, of industrialization as it's looked until now, and what, what and when you and you ask for research money and you go out and, and, and try to, to deal with aspects like we're talking about, there seems to be two ways of, two kinds of solutions. One is this with, you know, with floating cars and bitcoins and uh, smartphones and high technology and every time like with the, the contract of tomorrow will be someone sitting with the iPad and the drones will do all the building and stuff like that. So one solution lies up there, but what we can see and when we've dived into it is that usually this kind of logic and this kind of even circular economy that can be in these end up using more resources than we than than they uh, uh, than other solutions so there might be another way into this not that there are not ideas in this that seems to be valid but there are definitely other strategies that at least in the short term have higher impacts and these we are, we call now the three strategy levels and what we've looked at is basically are under this title pallet moves and well-being and basically they relate to three like immediate approaches to architecture and construction. One deals with what we are painting with when we are doing our stuff, the material. The other one is how we do it, like the technology used. And, and thirdly, and most difficultly, but also maybe with the one with most, uh, or at least with a lot of promise, is how we understand and, w and work with well-being, especially, and to some degree you could say that is the indoor climate. So a, a bit of work, this is another uh, project that I've been working on, but that ties into this in the sense that we were looking at, okay, this is the material, construction material pyramid, some of you might have seen it, but all the materials in the bottom, at least seen from here now, are very low impact. And of course, that's a way to look at it. Okay, we don't have, we don't have much idea about what will happen with these materials in the long term, but at least if we're under the line of zero, we've pulled more CO2 out of the atmosphere than we've released. So that could be one strategy. But the, the problem is, and, and I think that is one of the things that in this project become quite interesting because we're talking about real materials and real products, it becomes less abstract, is that most of this climate crisis and the stuff that we're in, is, it, it comes to us in form of numbers. So we have to figure out ways of transforming the numbers of an LCA or the numbers of CO2 releases and into, into tangible ac actions. And I think... That is what we've di we did uh, in, the, in the pyramid and, and what we've done here. And now we're trying to, to change, you know, the, the line underneath this uh, food pyramid with, uh, with construction materials that actually, that actually do this, that, that, uh, that have a, a, a great impact. But in the sense, so trying to make this data not just sensuous, but concrete in the sense that we're pointing towards uh, materials that are really there. I'm not going to say much about that. But this opens up for a long list of, of questions that we also need to discuss. Uh, it's not, uh, the answer's not just living down there, we have to figure out other, other stuff as well. Um, and uh, one of them, of course, is that we can't just look at what materials do now, we have to also discuss what they do over time. And I think this is something that we've come back to in many ways, and I think that that, that, that will be substantiated or is substantiated in our research. Because what can we really say about time and construction? Not much, really. We don't, we don't know. We know that just before something can sustain, does not make it sustainable. Right now we have no real ideas about how to tackle the, the problems of, um, of material lifespan in construction. Because in the best cases, we might be talking about not just 50, but 100, 200 years. And what will happen in construction in that time is really difficult to foresee now. So this actually just enforces us in saying, it's just not one, it's just not just one lifetime. There could be aesthetics. Right now, we're tearing down and building new just because it's cheaper. Uh, then transformation and stuff like this. So a lot of lifetimes are in there, but maybe the, the cut that we did makes sense in the, in, in to, as a starting place to say, okay, we're working with very low impact, upfront very low impact materials, then we're doing something right. 
but it does not take away from the problem. And this, the, so the strategy cannot stand alone. Um, and you can say, some people will say, oh, we just have to build very, maybe high impact material, but that lasts long. But the, we only, and we call this the Pantheon thesis um, or Pantheon idea now. But the, 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 the result is just that we only have one Pantheon in the world. And what happens to materials gener generally, well, they end down here. And it has nothing to do with the material on its own. It has something to do with trends and ghetto plans and politics and economy. So pellet can get us somewhere. And when we're looking at finding the cases with very low upfront impacts, Feldbald Free School was one of we're looking at from an architectural point of view. It is not all the way there. And I think if you, when we get a full hold of the full LCA, what happens from here and up? It's very good. So there are very, a lot of ideas there in bringing down the upfront impact. So from a pallet point of view, this is a quite interesting building. When we then looked at the cases of, of materials and companies that we could interview, a, a company like Seul became very, very interesting, especially because the material is something that just washes up on the, on the beaches. And why not use it for something while it's there? So it's a resource that we don't even have to have an, uh, an industry around or a farming industry around. So that became very interesting, and that is one of the cases that Miku will point to later. Another one is Ikukukun. It's straw, um, um, straw bale elements, but made into industrial elements, almost like concrete elements. The clever thing about them is that when you build them like this, in, like in a concrete element, you have to have some insulation and other parts. But this does both the load-bearing construction and the insulation part in one system. What's even more neat is that this is a waste product, in most of it from farming, general farming. So right now, a lot of it is being, either being burned for energy or just lying around on the fields. So from a pellet point of view, this makes sense as well. Toltec is an interesting case as well because the, they, they seem to have been, uh, been around for a long time uh, with a product that fits very well in this discussion. And that's also interesting for us to look at, that some of these actually had the right idea, but now they have a context to talk about it in that actually um, benefits them in many ways. But looking at the material just as the material, it's, uh, it's also a very low impact material with, that, that does a lot of interesting things. But as I said, what we're looking at in this, in this project, we had to divide into three strategies. But basically, what would have been lovely is we, if we could have found a case that did all three strategies at once, but we couldn't find that. So now we're moving to, to the next strategy level. So we, we had the palette. We are, we are drawing with something. But we could not, in that system, uh, make a, a, a clear uh, projection of where these materials will end over time. But we can influence them. And some of the materials, even f from a design point of view, we can do quite a lot with if we design with them in a clever way. And a lot of different strategies can be used. So instead of just saying, OK, this material will last for 20 years, and then we'll do something else. No, let's see if we can, if we can do something that unties the relations between materials. One thing could be design, um, um, designed for this assembly, where we simply put things together in a way that they can be taken apart. That would mean that it's not the construction or the idea as a whole, or ghetto planner, or whatever it could be, that politics or aesthetics, uh, that defines the lifespan of uh, construction. It's the technical idea of things can be taken apart. Many other ways of dealing with design and longevity of materials can be employed. And MOVES kind of tries to umbrella all of them. But basically, we have a lot of, of ideas here. And a lot of these have quite, I think, talking as an architect, quite of an interesting aesthetic potentials as well. Because what happens when you start dealing with the detail in this way that it has to be taken apart? Well, the details become visible. and the joints become, uh, in some cases, uh, ornamental. And before we started using concrete for everything in, in the brickwork, it was basically, a, which is basically an ad adhesive or cast-in solution now, where, you, where, you, where, the, where the mortar is stronger than the stone. Well, before we used limestone mortar, and that meant that we could take things apart and reuse them. Basically, born in a time where it was just much more important that we can do this, and before we had, we, before we had concrete. If you look at how we did uh, um, construction, like uh, wood frame uh, structures, uh, that was also idea from a time where uh, materials were just much more costly than, than labor was. 
So everything was, of course, used by, used, reuse in, in a lot of cases, and also designed in a way that things could be taken apart. And this as well, and if you combine these kind of ideas with, with the one I showed you before in the palette, then you can say, okay, the bulk of the material in this solution is from the very bottom of the pyramid, very low upfront materials. And then the stuff that makes sure that things can be taken apart are maybe more high impact, but maybe that's the way to look at things. That, that the high impact, the top of the pyramid is not illegal, you just have to think when you're using these materials much more than what we're doing today. So that is may maybe a combination as well and p draws on a different uh, take on this strategy that is not only about using completely low impact, it's also about the synergies that they point towards because one material always points to the next. And for cases for this study, we looked at this and this is actually quite an, a third way of looking at how moves and technology can, can be taken into consideration. It's, it's called Grand Prague and it's in Paris and, and basically it's, it's one of these major, one of these buildings that would, the 60s and 70s that everyone seems to hate and that are being demolished now for many uh, reasons and usually it has nothing to do with the construction and this was transformed into something else. So this adds material, it doesn't even necessarily add low impact material but by doing clever additions of materials then you make the whole load bearing high impact structure of the building less. So that's maybe a third way that moves can come into play. So this is the case in the study we've done when we're looking at it from an architectural price approach and when we're looking at it from a more uh, material, like a comp component uh, level, then we are looking at uh, delta beam with oh, a picos uh, materials that are basically built for designed for disassembly, but also uh, but, but maybe even uh, originally a, a bit as an accident because it was about doing concrete structures in a, in a climate where it gets very cold so co concrete couldn't, couldn't uh, bind. So they made a way of doing different structures that, that so we mechanically could take things apart. And now they are moving, not just, they're moving, they're still in the concrete business, but moving into the wood construction building well, pointing again to the stuff in the bottom of the pyramid. So this is one technology that we are looking at uh, uh, when we are talking about moves. Another one, um, a more local one, um, from Denmark at least, is detained nilbrudning that looks at, in, look at, looks at the potential of, of all the stuff that they tear down, basically. Uh, they demolish buildings and, and instead of just looking at, uh, at demolished materials as a, as a cost, something you have to get rid of, they are trying to make solutions and work with people to, to figure out ways to bring these materials back to life and have a relevance again. So this is another strategy that looks at what's there, but tries to, 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 uh, to take another technological approach to materiality to bring potential in what was otherwise waste. And then I think the last strategy, and again, I wish we could have found one that, um, like, uh, uh, that had all of them, but because uh, uh, I think this is a very interesting one and also very difficult, but also very underdeveloped, at least in a Danish context is the idea of well-being, both to have a discussion about how we really understand well-being and what it takes to make a building where people uh, are uh, doing well in. And I think once you start really looking into this, th this is where the innovation of nothing becomes quite clear, because many of the synergies that you can put into play here will take away unnecessary system and materials uh, in, uh, like one after another in great synergies. And this is where you, uh, subtraction becomes very evident. If you go back to the old hierarchy and in these circular economy days, we often talk about reuse, reduce, reuse and recycle and they're down here. But in the old waste hi hierarchy, there was something before that was, like, that was called a void. And here's where we can really look at how to, to do avoidance as a strategy. This is something that I usually bring when we talk about these things, and it, it won't be in the book, but I think it's interesting, and it's kind of cool has been a project. Because in a building like the one we're sitting in now, or most uh, buildings that are presented, this is, the, this is the reality of the space that we're in. But basically, it is built around technological compensation because the building cannot in any way, shape, or form stand on its own. A building with that mu as much glass and with the compositions that we're using today, overheat, and every office building, more or less in Denmark, have cooling now, or CTS controlled dynamic solar shading and shafts and so on and so on. System upon system added to the equation to compensate for the fact that the building cannot sustain life on its own. 
So could we address this in a, di in a different way? And I think definitely we can. And one of the examples that we're using for this and in the book, in the architectural example, is Baumschlager Ibelis 2226. The interesting thing, he was just at the architecture school, so my, some of you might have heard him talk, Dietmar Ibelis. And, and one of their strategies is that you have to, do, you have to, uh, to uh, construct buildings that do not overheat. That's the simple solution, but it's more sophisticated than that because what basically they're left with, because there are no heating, there are no cooling, there are no ventilation, there are no dynamic solar shading, there are no ventilation aggregates on the, on, the, on the roof, there are no shafts. And when all of this disappears, then the suspended ceiling disappears. And when that disappears, then you don't need as high walls, and then there are steps in the staircase, and so on and so on. The synergies are massive. So this building, just the only thing it requires is that people show up for work. They are the energy source combined with the artificial lighting. And when they do this, this building is called 2226, then the building is just the same between 22 and 26 degrees all year long. And this is a solution where we kill off system upon system upon system. It is not made from the right pallet, it's not in like right pallet code. Uh, it's not made from low impact materials. It's not designed for disassembly, but I think if it was, then we would really be starting to move places. So for the last, the, the, for our, our products, that are talking into this line, this approach, talking about how to think about well-being and passive uh, in the, um, uh, indoor climate controls. We looked at ventilationswindel, which is a system that basically takes in air when needed through the window, and instead of having a three-layer, four-layer glazing in our windows, they just have in essence, it, it would be enough with two layers. And then the, the energy loss you have through the first, you lose to yourself. Of course, the air is going in through the, in the cavity of the windows. This is an old tradition, something that the Russians came up with 200 years ago. But, uh, but now it's organized with a pump that can actually close and can open to the other one. It's, it's not, it doesn't take any energy, and it's in, in that sense, it's a very clever solution. And maybe this could help fix some of the indoor problems that we are otherwise using a lot of energy and a lot of system and a lot of space to do. So that's one of them. The other one is that, at least in the Baumschlager Ebele case, the 2226 building I just showed a little bit, the only mechanics they have is that they cross-ventilate windows. Uh, and this could be a good solution, window masters. Small pumps that are being told by a uh, uh, CO2 uh, measuring when there's not, not a good air quality, then the windows just open and you cross-ventilate and they close again. And of course, this is a very interesting solution because it also tells us that we have to, to be in the buildings in a different way, that the whole concept of well-being being might be something that we have to renegotiate in essence. Because what happens on a, on a cold winter's day when this happens, then, then you get cold air in, your, in the back of your neck. But I think that's when you stand up and go get a cigarette or you go to the toilet or get a cup of coffee or talk with your colleague or do something else. Or in essence, you can also go stand up and close it. But it... Uh, it takes that you are in a dynamic relationship with the buildings that I think we've lost in many buildings where no one can regulate the indoor climate. So these are the strategies, and I will stop now and let Miguel continue, uh, and the cases that we chose on the basis of these strategies. And with that, here you go. Thank you so much, Freddy. Yeah, so... I forgot to say that this research project is supported by Reldania and Grønland's Investings Fund has been going on for the last two years. So what, what I'd like to talk about now is what happens to companies that pursue these three strategies that uh, Pelle is suggesting. So what we did uh, was simply to... Um, yeah, well, um, what we did was to look into uh, to these seven companies, uh, having in-depth interviews with them. Then we had a process of distilling these themes into more and more defined themes and not go through that and have some publications about that. Um, and uh, yeah, this is just a snapshot of some of the initial notes we had from, from the interviews and um, these five overall themes as, as we see, um, that, um, that even though they, they start out with different technologies, a lot of the trajectories they, they have are identical. They all f face the problem that they, they do not only have to sell the products, they also have to shape the market. They have to find and form the customer before they can actually engage and sell to the customer. We also see that they have a lot of trouble and a lot of work to do with the existing regulations and, and rules. That is really a major theme, uh, that they're not com compatible with 
yeah, with the existing regime. We also see that there's a very long road from starting out to, um, yeah, to being on the market. None of the examples we've seen have been doing anything successfully in the market sense in less than 10 years, and that's a bit depressing. Um, but we also see, and, and because in many ways this is a story about despair, it is quite difficult to do anything uh, that is really sustainable, but it's also one of hope. And, 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 and something on the hope side is that that these companies, they do survive, actually, in spite of a lot of problems, because they're able to mobilize other kinds of resources. And these other kinds of resources and these other kinds of e dynamics are really what interests me. I have a background within economics, I should say, and, and, and the different way market works in different stages. And what you need to do as a company in different stages, that is really what is, is of interest to me and, and what is this research project is, is also um, about. Um, so, let, just to give you a, a very short glimpse into what, ha what happens actually during these 10 years or so when these companies, these different companies, have been trying to introduce these new uh, solutions to the built environment. And, um, yeah, what happens when this basic sustainable idea m meets, you might say, the cruel uh, world of, of the construction industry. And, uh, as Pillis is explaining, it all started out with a in, a, in a way, very simple idea, actually. I mean, why not use straw balls, put them on top of each other and build a house? I mean, I used to do that as a kid on the field next to me. I mean, it's such an obvious idea, a material that is just around. Why not take this seaweed and stack it and press it, as we also used to do on houses and in mattresses, and use it for building material? Or why not just simply open the door or window at the right moment in time? I mean, it's so obvious that he is looking into the problems we have regarding sustainability. Uh, so, yeah, what happens when, when you try to introduce these kind of ideas? So, it started out with a very simple idea, and the inventor, the person of the few persons who are introducing this idea, feel pretty comfortable that they can actually do this themselves. I mean, it is just something that is quite, in a technical sense, uh, quite achievable. Um, but what they realized, first thing, is that, that in order to fit to the constru construction industry, they have to expand on the product range. For instance, Seoul, they learned that they had to add uh, materials in order to make a stiffness, stiffness in their seaweed plat uh, yeah, board. So they had to add one material. Then they also learned that because they added this material, they also have to add fire, uh, retarding elements, and then they had to add and add and add. So starting out with a product that was only made of one material, now they had a very complex product. And, and likewise, uh, Henbel, they started out with straw. They also learned that in order to get anywhere, they need to fix fire. So in the first versions of the, of the product, they also added the clay uh, cladding. And, and in any case, what we see is they, they have to add products and they have to take a simple product and make it quite complex in order to, to fit to regulations or the requirements from carpenters and, and so on. So that is one thing, that they have to expand on the product range. Another thing is very often actually they have to address not the market they would really like to address. In the case of, um, uh, of Lars and uh, Kuhn, he would like to make a building system that was general, generally applicable to all house builders in Denmark. But he found that they were quite conservative, so he had to only look at do-it-yourself uh, eco environments. Uh, so he, some freaky guys who would really like to do this, he had to, to address. And, um, and similarly, uh, in the case of Seul, the original idea from them was to, to make an insulation material. And they found out that obviously the competition was really tough from existing players in Denmark. I mean, insulation materials in Denmark, that is tough business. So rather they made a kind of board that you could put on the wall and had acoustic properties. And then later on, perhaps, they can address what they really would like to, to do. So a simple idea, they have to move around um, the product range. And then the other thing they also learn is that, ah, they would like only to manufacture a small part of it. In the case of ventilation, they would like to manufacture only the ventilation part. But as no one else is providing the rest of the window in a proper way, they have to produce the whole window. In the case of Seoul, they found out that no one was really, really able to manufacture uh, these boards in the right way, so they have to invest in manufacturing equipment and have to partner up with manufacturers in order to, to do this. 
In the case of uh, Window Master, they found out that none of the indoor environment engineers like to use their system uh, because it, they couldn't calculate the way they, they used to, be, to do. So Window Master and uh, also Ventilations window, window, they had to invent in uh, software solutions that made it easy for, yeah, for the indoor environment engineers to calculate. So they also partly became a software provider and so on. So they had to invest and engage heavily downstream and upstream the, the value chain. So as you can see, gradually things expand and getting more and more uh, complicated uh, for the company. And what they do in order to solve this is obviously they try to hire more people on a very limited budget. So perhaps now they're not one person or two person, but perhaps four or five persons. And that helps a bit, but and here comes a big but there's still so many things that has to be dealt with in order to to introduce this novel simple sustainable idea um, at one hand um, you have to create customer expectations and you have to shape customer ex expectation for instance so they had to install their product in a restaurant where people could see and experience what it was all about of course they didn't sell anything out of that but that was kind of the market creation expectations thing uh, there's a tough, very tough work to do on legislation, and that is national legislation, but also all the standards and norms on how fire regulations are done, how acoustic uh, testing is, is done, and so on. And it is, for instance, when you talk to Ventilations Vindu, and you ask them, what was, in all the years you have been working hard, for the last 10 years, what was the most significant achievement you made? And I think they would say, I'm pretty sure they would say, that was that they had the word, um, um, sorry, yeah, sorry, it was also the intention. It was that they had two words added to building, uh, to Bygningsrelement, the National Building Code, and that is, and other ventilation. So they worked 10 years for having this sentence, and other ventilation. And similar, Tisa um, Nedbrunning, the one who made the orangerie, they had the word, Orangerie mentioned in the building regulation. And they had meeting at Christian's Paul, and they had years and years of serious fight just to have that word mentioned because then people can appreciate that, okay, it is okay to use. Just to give an example about how much, and I've, I mean, we knew that before starting, but I have to say I was overwhelmed by the death of this, um, yeah, this barrier. Then, as said, there's also a lot of work that you have to do downstream and upstream the value chain. You have to invest heavily in finding manufacturers who would like to produce your product. Uh, it's not easy because you're a small producer. So to invest some, convince somebody that he has to convince perhaps two or five millions in a specific equipment for producing, it's not really easy. Um, so there's a lot of things going down here. Um, and then finally, um, you also have to, uh, to work uh, on the bigger political scene, partly to uh, affect these norms and rules, but also to subtract, uh, attract funding and, and government support and, and, and so on. So what we see here, I have been pushing some buttons here, I can see uh, while talking. Anyway, so it is quite difficult from a managerial point of view, which is my interest to do all this. Uh, and you do wonder, how do they manage even? I mean, how do they manage? I mean, it is quite <laughs> difficult. And what we learned is that they are able to mobilize different kind of resources, not in an economic sense, but in a wider, not strictly economic sense. And we've kind of pinpointed that down to seven roles that are in play when you talk about introducing novel uh, sustainable solutions. It might be five, it might be 10. That is not the most important thing. The most important thing is to say that there are dif different roles that are in play that goes beyond the mere, the mere thing that the inventor does uh, himself or herself. So, so one very important um, role, I have to go the right way now. So one very important role and one very important capacity to have within a firm, that is the troubleshooter guy. Um, in, the, in the case of Ventilations window, they hired a guy who knew nothing about ventilations or windows, but he had launched another product in the, the construction industry, Unitrain. You might know it. So he had been using, which is also a bit puzzling that you have to spend five or 10 years on regulation in order to have not a round, <laughs> but a, a long squared unit range. But anyway, it is, a, it is a struggle. So he was really good at, at all these regulatory things. So um, he was on board pretty, pretty soon on as, as, as the most important 
second person employed in the company. Um, another very important uh, profile of a role to activate is, is the Conny Moore exper expert. That is a person that is not working within or for the company, but who is a technical expert very often. For instance, uh, a guy saying it is actually feasible, uh, possible to make houses work the proper way with natural ventilation. There was a person at DTU kind of saying, OK, clients and regulatory bodies, it can actually work what they're saying, these uh, natural uh, ventilation windows. It's not only crazy guys who say this. So the ability to, to address and use research. And we often talk about the role of research in making things happen. And to, to the, for the examples we look at, it's not so much they, that they give a, a very important input up front. I mean, it's not like these ideas are based on some very advanced science. It's more likely they're based on common sense and what we used to do in the old days or something like that. But research has a very important role of understanding why solutions are working and also explaining to others why they're working. So they have a very important role, but perhaps not in the outset, but, but more, more later, later on. Um, then a fourth category, which is perhaps a bit wide, is, is the gatekeeper. And that is the person or the persons who don't really spend a lot of the time uh, on the project. They might spend five minutes on the project. Uh, but are the persons who can say, OK, hey, Lars from Eco Cocoon, I think you should talk to this guy because he might need, uh, he's building up uh, a, a new gym at uh, this after school and he might need something. Or in, an, in another case, you might going to talk to this ventilation guy, but he, he'll be able to to deliver the valve you need for your ventilation win window and so on. So these incidental meetings that just point you the right directions um, are, are, are critical. Then, and that also goes with, um, with the things up here, finding the first customer is like really, really, really difficult um, because you don't have any proof. It's quite costly to, to make and it's really difficult to get approved by by the authorities and, and so on. So if you look at what the company spent a lot of time on in the early days, that is um, finding the first person who would like to build this. And I say the first person because it's not like a very big professional client in most cases. It's mostly a very personal, dedicated person who buys into not the product so much, but more the, per the person delivering the, the product. So it's, and this is also why it can only be the inventor himself who do the sales things in the outset, in the beginning. Because some of these companies working in the early stage, they have this idea that, OK, well, I'd just like to stick to the technology, and then I hire a guy to do the sales part. And it never works. Um, so yeah. Um, so finding the key customer and being the key customer. And then obviously also uh, the donor, the one who's financing, because I think it's probably not difficult to get a sense that being an inventor is not a really lucrative thing to be. It takes like five to ten years before you are in the market in any profitable sense, or at least where you have an income, and you have to invest heavily in all making all these things um, yeah, happening. So finding donors um, and uh, yeah, public funding or public available funding uh, is 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 uh, yeah, is is key, and. It is important also to say here, this is not commercial investors because they do not engage themselves in these early mar markets activities. They only engage themselves in activities that can be with a calculated risk. But in this situation, you can't calculate risk. I mean, you have fundamental uncertainty, uh, so you can't calculate anything here. Um, so, so you have to find donors who's more in it for uh, soft donors, uh, not commercial, in commercial investors. And then finally, also, there's a very important role to play for the approving authority. For instance, uh, Tita Nedbrydning, the one who's doing Orangeria, the orange series, um, they spend a lot of time on going from one municipality to another and finding the person at one municipality who would actually approve that it was okay to have these, to use this um, in spite of all the fire regulations you, you usually, usually have. So, and it didn't seem to be a very dangerous thing with respect to fire regulations. Not at all, actually, but none of this. So I think one outcome from, from the research study we have been doing is that to, to, to kind of clarify that of obviously the inventor, the guy who, or the person or the woman who comes up with this idea is, is critical. But the main ability, perhaps, is not so much to have this an initial technical idea, but the main ability is perhaps to mobilize this broader field of competences and, and actors around this idea. 
So that is one finding we try to, to look into, and I don't know at all how we're doing on time. Um, Fine, we have about 10 minutes. Okay. I see any questions from the chat. I okay. have a question. Another? Okay. okay, so that, was, that is one finding. What we then looked into um, was, um, okay, what do you need to know or what do you need to do? And in order to do that, what do you need to know as a company to manage all these problems and barriers as, as you meet on your journey? And, and that is, Philly, you mentioned one, the outcome will be a, a book. More precisely, it will be a book for teachers. And more precisely, it will be a book about what are the capabilities you need in order to innovate new solutions, sustainable solutions, driven by firms, not only done by firms, but driven by firms. Um, so, so that is the other thing we looked into. And um, our key observation or hypothesis, you might say, has, has been and, and still is that, that we have obviously this idea, or we know that a product will mature over time from a simple idea to something that is made and documented and can be produced um, at a large scale. Um, really having an impact with respect, with respect to uh, on sustainability. What we were looking at is how will the company need to mature in order to make the product uh, mature? So, and some of you might know this, but there's some quite well developed terminology for different kind of ready levels. Yeah, how mature technology is. Uh, we talk about the technological readiness levels that is, uh, yeah, a stru structure used by the EU, for instance. So we. We have a quite precise language about that. What we do not have a very precise language about is what are the company readiness levels that should be at different levels. And that is really what we're trying to, to develop. And this is a first attempt, and I think much more research could be done. Uh, but non nonetheless, a, a first attempt to that. And I think the sad news is that you need to do a lot of things as this inventing company. The good news is that you don't need to do everything at once. Um, and there's some issues that we usually consider to be core disciplines of running a company. Um, for instance, you need to have a professional sales organization, or you need to be able to do large scale supply chain management. You need to be able to do narratives that can convince people that you're doing the right thing. But these are activities for later, for later on. Uh, in the beginning, these things are not important because you are the sales team yourself. You don't have to build narratives because you have such a strong narrative with your original idea and, and so on. Um, it doesn't make sense that you have like a very professional organization doing a lot of advanced calculations on your return on investment because these kind of calculations uh, is nonsense at, at this point. So a lot of the things that we consider that companies should do, you don't have to do in the outset. In the outset, in the beginning. At the other hand, there are some things you need to be really good at really early on. One thing is to attract funding, soft funding, uh, and also convince, for instance, suppliers, the first cons uh, the first key customers to be on, on, on board and so on, um, on a much more personal level and, and so on. And the ability to constantly shift what you're doing. Okay, you might thought that you're going to work on this market, but it turns out that you've got to work on another niche market and so on. So there is perhaps some kind of order, some kind of sequence that tell us that you don't have to be good at everything. Uh, and also tell us it is perhaps something else than what we usually think you should be good at that is most important in, in the outset. So what we're getting into is that, that there is perhaps a quite different dynamic going on, whether you are in an emerging market where you're introducing a new group of solution. And this is not something that we, we invented, I have to say. This is product lifecycle dynamics, which has been a concept that has been around for at least 50 years, um, uh, with Otterback, for instance, as a, as a main the yeah, one coining this uh, theoretical concept. But what we're getting at is that when you introduce a new kind of technology, you'll see that you don't have any sale. You'll also, also see that you have a lot of different ways to do it. And I think that is what we see now, for instance, with uh, bio-based building materials. We don't have any sale at all. There's a lot of research going on, a lot of different concept of how you can do bio-based materials, but it's not clear at all exactly how they will put, be put together and exactly how they will be used. Then later on, you'll see that as a dominant design uh, emerges and that you don't have a, a, a very big variation um, in the product range. And you'll also have a shake out where you have a few companies that will go, grow bigger and bigger. So if you take the material, if, if you take insulation, for instance, or rock wool, you'll have a very 
you have a very few players playing here, and you have a very fixed design on, on how you do things. And so you have the emerging mar market logic and the, the mature market logic. And what we're pointing at is that in emerging market, the, the way you solve problem is really difficult. You have to shift perspective all the time. Um, unlike, um, and, and you have a leadership, you have a management um, that needs to be in, involved in all activities. You cannot say, okay, you do the sales part and you do the product development part because there's so much intermixed all the time. So you need the management or the leader, you might say in this case, to be involved in all activities. You cannot come put it into a, a hierarchical uh, structure. So this is kind of how it looks uh, with respect to problem solving and, 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 yeah, and the organizational diagram within emerging markets. And, and this is how, it, of course, it's simplified, but nonetheless, uh, how it looks more like in, in mature markets where you can, to a high degree, have a sequen sequenced way of doing the problem solving and you can put it out into... Um, and this is also why... Uh, when you're in the early market, you cannot grow companies. It's not only because you don't have the sales organization, it's also because you don't have the knowledge structure that allows you to put things into small boxes that can work on their own. So, and this is, I'll skip for the, for the time, <laughs> due to the time. So what we're getting at is that what you need to know and what you need to do working in early stage markets, as we have seen for these seven companies working with these three strategies for achieving absolute sustainability, working by the principles, to some degree, at least at innovation of nothing. What you need to know and what you need to do is quite different from what you need to know and what you need to do when working in a mature market. And for me, that has been... I always felt that sometimes when we looked at a lot of the companies, not only the one we looked at in this case study, but also some of them we have been looking at in Smith Innovation, I was OK, you say, guys, it's... Impressing what you're doing, but you do a lot of things wrong. And, uh, <laughs> and I kind of realized, well, perhaps you don't do things wrong. You perhaps do it the only way you can do things when you're working in these early stage market. And I think there's a lot of implications from that. Obviously, there's some implications directly for the, for the companies working in these fields. There's also a huge implication for the, for the consultancy trying to help these. And also a very huge uh, implication for the donors and organization and the framing institutions that would allow. And what we should really be careful of is applying the logics of the big firms in mature markets to the early stage uh, yeah, situations. So we should perhaps, and that is, would be my last word, not be so much about focusing on having specialized capabilities uh, where you know exactly what to do in a given situation, but more having dynamic capabilities uh, allowing you not to follow rules, but to forming rules, which by the end of the day also have the implication that what you need to teach and train is something different. Thank yeah, you. I think that was a <laughs> huge it. round of applause, I think. Thank you. Don't go out of your way, guys. Mm -hmm. You can do better than that. We'll finish with a massive round of applause. Just before I start, have, because I have loads of questions, so, but I'll, out of politeness and courtesy, any questions from uh, you guys with us in the audience? Before we met today, I had the privilege, I actually had a meeting with Ken Webster. Mm -hmm. And for those yes, of you that. who do not know Ken Webster, he is one of the guys who framed the strategy and concepts and a lot of knowledge input for, uh, for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Mm -hmm. He's also the guy who coined circular economy and he has, he has written a lot of books. He does a lot of public speaking. And uh, one of the discussions that came up with Ken Webster today was the sense of urgency. Uh, that we are facing multiple crises at the same time. We know these, I won't reiterate them because people tend to get sad, but suffice it to mm. say, there is a sense of urgency. We do have certain things to address. Um, when you have done this, and I, I'm fond of so many aspects of this research project, and I like, Miga, what you say, no, these people are not doing it wrong. We need to understand what they're doing in emergent markets. But 
Pelle, you also say absolute sustainability mm -hmm. within architecture, uh, construction. Ah, that's a tough one mm -hmm. to achieve. And you said, Mikkel, these, these companies have been working on it for at least 10 years. Mm. So my question, of course, is given the sense of urgency, is there any way that we can take key lessons to kind of try and inspire other people to start creating the innovation of nothing? Yeah, I can start. Because mm. I, I think like what I hope is mm. that, uh, or at least when identifying the seven roles, I think now I know that you were just presenting at the architecture school the other day, and uh, to your audience, uh, when you stepped in and told me, it, it sounded like you, you, we really hit a nerve in the sense that they're getting that these seven roles are not fixed. In the sense that if you just look at it from an architectural point of view, when I look at all these roles, there are architects in all these positions if you look at them out there. So as an architect, at least, or an engineer or whatever, like, then you can actually take upon yourself more than one role. Yeah. And I think that is, that is, I think, a potential because I think we have, we have a tendency to, to, to think about what we do in, in, in closed off boxes. And that is not necessary. Uh, so I, like, what is a, like, the, the general idea basically is how can we propel these things? How can we make sure that, that these things, mm. uh, uh, that, that it may not have to take mm. 10 years if you have a good idea? Mm. And I think one of the solutions might be that just, or I hope, that just by pointing at these roles, more people will begin to say, oh, okay, I might be a, an approving authority, but I know these guys, th this guy who, who could be a Conor Moore expert because they need documentation. If, if someone one thought it was interesting, then... Yes, because you so. have the researchers, the Conor Moore expert, as you were mm. saying, Miguel, we, we need so much research within, within yeah. these new ideas. Yeah. And, so, and sometimes they really open the door. Yes. Because the report that says that this, that this and this kind of ventilation works, yeah. then all of a sudden the key client will emerge mm. because he mm. will dare to invest in it. Yeah. So and these that things can be that can be the client from a municipality. Maybe. But even, you're yeah. saying that the first the first key customer is usually not a, a large scale customer. The first customer is usually someone. Yeah, because he's he's running so big risk. Uh, yeah. he, he or she is running such a big yeah. risk that it's not. It will never be a big client or no. never be a conventional client. Yeah. I think. Uh, I mean, the question you ask is obviously vital. Okay, we need urgent change, and what we're saying is things take time. Yeah. Uh, it's not so much of an answer, but I think at least we are ruling out. There's no silver bullet. There's not a silver bullet saying just invest heavily in technology, because it's not mainly or only about technology. Mm -hmm. It's also, there's not a silver bullet saying, okay, leave it to the big firms, because mm -hmm. we have also, five of these have been rather small, two of them have been bigger. It is interesting to see that also the big company, um, they have the same problem of convincing, not so much external investors, but more the internal board, that they need to do a turnaround. So it took equally long time for them to and do it. And that I think is uh, a really, really interesting point to get across that it's, that it's, yeah. yeah. So the vague shape of a silver bullet might yeah. be the, the ability to make this system work together in a more smooth way. Um, mm. yeah, yeah, that's a, it's, you, that's a beautiful segue to my next uh, question because part, and you know this, you've done so, ex so much extensive research that the construction industry uh, is project-based. Uh, we talk about it a lot in terms of the silos mm -hmm. and whatnot. So, so what you're actually alluding to here at the end, Miguel, is that this can also be another narrative to push kind of cross-collaboration between silos. Mm -hmm. Definitely, you can say the, the whole the book, the teaching material that we are trying to put together, also address more than one institution, mm -hmm. and that's actually a quite a big challenge because, to some degree, we speak different languages. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at an engineer and you're looking at mm -hmm. architects and stuff, but not, but not, uh, but not completely. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, again, returning to the roles, to, to be able to see that you can kind of. Like if you're not just, you can be both an engineer and an architect, not trying to just conform to the rules, but to suggest different ways of doing it. And maybe you'll stand stronger if you, if you come from both sides of the table, pointing to a solution that yeah. might work. So, but I think uh, just one last comment yeah, perhaps yes. is that there's also a kind of a silver bullet in the Bam Club, even at 22, 26, because what it tells us is that you could actually do significant improvements. Um, 
with quite simple technical solutions, but with a, another kind of design mm -hmm. thinking. Um, so um, I think, I mean, it is a positive thing that we do have solutions available that can be... And this is, I, I think this is putting them together some and, of the really uh, interesting key takeaways from your research is actually that there are solutions, there is hope. Definitely, definitely. And I, I think, and I think what is really potentially quite beautiful about it is that most of the solutions that we look up end up, and also when you're on the other side of this curve and complexity rises and they thought they were doing vessels, but now they have to do pumps and they have to do windows and everything. Once they get to that point, they can return to something that's quite simple. The other things can, can disappear and they can, they can yeah. go back to the quite simple solution. But the journey and to get there is quite complex. And so, so there's something about to do some of the really simple really good solution takes complex ideas mm -hmm. and complex frameworks of collaboration and uh, it's very difficult to do something that's quite simple and it's very easy at least within construction to just add and add and add and add yes. so uh, so maybe we're just removing complexity and that of course points to a, hun a whole other can of worms that we have to like to, to actually think a building must become much more expensive because it's very complex mm -hmm. but to build the building will become much cheaper yeah and we're running out of resources, so it might make sense that to so flip that thing around. Yeah, so we're so actually flipping where some of the costs will lie. Yeah, yeah. investing yeah. in thinking and, yeah. and doing less, yeah. instead of thinking less and doing more. Yeah. Investing in actually addressing yeah. the complexity of the processes and in, in, in coming up with the simple solution. Yeah. So, funnily enough, Think more, build less. I think it's not so surprising <laughs> that some people would say yeah. that. It's just kind of, yeah. Mm. yeah, but but I but think the, the interesting part is that it's not like it's not. Then people here that build less, it's just, we're not going to build anything. Or like the best thing would be that we don't transform or do anything. And that's not what we're saying. We're just saying that to to build really good and build less, mm. it, it's it's still something that holds great value and it's there. It's just very complex complex to do. It's very yeah. complex, and it also, I think you, you mentioned it a good few times, but okay, I wish I had one case that kind of uh, encompassed all the mm -hmm. various uh, exactly. principles. That's not possible, but we need the role models. We need the, the cases of the ones that have embarked on, on, on threading out and defining, showing us the way. Yeah. And Miguel, you had a really interesting point in terms of the innovation, in terms of the emergent markets, that there are certain, that when you're dealing, pushing, changing, I'm going back to that green transition, we're changing the emergent market, that's not where you grow, that's where you do other things. And I just mm. want, uh, wanted to see, Pil, if you had any kind of reflections uh, to that, because I thought it was a really salient point also to the rest of us, as you're saying, with the approving authorities, the, mm -hmm. the donors and whatnot. Where can the patient lies in, in accepting that we don't grow immediately? Yeah, and I think the patient also yeah. lies in ac accepting um, and perhaps also knowing beforehand that what you thought that was going to be your main mm. key your main interest and your mm. main work is not so much designing this wonderful piece of mm. uh, board made out of seawood. Mm. Um, it's not so much about constructing a beautiful ventilation. Pr it's about all the other stuff. And at least if we knew that, uh, if we know that beforehand, mm. uh, we can address it more systematically. Perhaps we can have the right people on board to that. And also perhaps with a bit less personal cost to the inventors because they learn it the really hard way yeah. and mm. it's costly. And it's also costly in a personal yeah. sense, yeah. because sometimes you actually feel a bit stupid. How could it be so? Mm. So at least the, acknowledging that and addressing yeah. that, I think, could also um, be part of yeah, the solution. So, so, so when we have an, um, an anonymous uh, cohort of people saying, we just want the scalable solutions now, mm -hmm. without putting words into no, it, yeah, that is not the time to ask for that in an emergent market or... No, but if, we, well, we, no. if you want scalable solution right now, you, you, you will use mature technologies. And, um, there you go. Mm. And but if we want the, simple, the right solutions in terms of the solutions that have addressed the complexity mm -hmm. Mm. of what it actually means to, create, to generate sustainable buildings, sustainable cities, mm -hmm. we'll take the time to address the complexity to come up with the simple, simple solutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't happen tomorrow. No. no. There's something... Some, something between the first and the fifth yeah. year, yeah. so to speak. Um, I mean, yeah. I think that I think that is uh, really valuable points. 
You mm. guys get one last chance. Did I ask the questions that you were saying? Yeah, 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 you're nodding. Okay. <laughs> Listen, guys, <laughs> thank you so much. It was a tour de force of extensive research, and uh, I think it's really impressive that you can condense it to, to a 60-minute uh, science talk. Mm. So thank you very, very much. We're going to do our best now to give them a huge send-off. I'm looking at someone with a broken wrist, so it's not fair. I'll look at someone <laughs> with both hands. You can stamp in the floor. Listen, thank you very much, guys. And thank you for participating. See you next time.